Welcome to Restore the Glory podcast. My name is Jake Kim. And I'm Bob Schutz. We are two Catholic therapists sharing what we've learned personally and professionally to help you on the journey of restoration. Bob, good to see you again. How's it going today? Going well. I'm I'm enjoying this. I look forward to this every time we do it. I do too. You know, I I really appreciated our, our last episode and just being able to unpack and get back in and be reminded of the power of the theology of the body and just all the various ways that it's such good news to us and whatnot. So that's where we're headed again. You know, we're in the series of the theology of the body. And today we're talking about identity. You know, John Paul II and the theology of the body kind of reflects on these, what you might call experiences. And it's basically common experiences that the human person has on very generic levels, like the experience of shame or the experience of love or the experience of communion. And those are super important to understand and help us understand healing because we have these universal experiences, et cetera. So today we're talking about identity, which really it correlates to one of the first sections in the theology of the body where John Paul II is talking about original man. Basically, that means people before the fall, uh, the experience of Adam and Eve before the fall. And then even more specifically to the experience of who am I and what am I in relation to God before I get into relation to anybody else. Anything else, Bob, you'd add there with that kind of introduction to this section? I think it's helpful to keep in mind John Paul II's background uh, with this in that um, he was both a profoundly holy man with a great understanding of scripture, Mm -hmm. but also a world-class philosopher in the area of phenomenology. So when you're talking about experiences, that was his whole field of study, is to see how our personal experiences fit with objective truth and reality. And so in our world where we've unhinged those two and we look at our experience and then we discount objective reality, he, he brought them together. And that's a lot of what the theology of the body is in my understanding is that that union and it's why it's such a gift for healing because it brings us into those experiences absolutely so yeah we're going to start off with a quote from pope benedict uh it's from the his i guess series called jesus of nazareth uh the quote says whoever wishes to heal man must see him in his wholeness and must know that this ultimate healing can only be god's love Matt, Bob, that's right out of your book, Be Healed. Um, And so, boy, does that summarize it nicely. (laughs) Yeah. uh, We use that quote at the beginning of every conference uh, for the healing the whole person. It's uh, just so much in there. Yeah. What's the first thing that jumps out to you? Well, two things. One is we need to see people in their wholeness, not in their brokenness, for us to facilitate their healing. And it's only God's love that's going to bring that healing, which is a lot of what we talked about last time is God's love. But this sense of seeing people in their wholeness, you know, we're so used to a broken world and us being broken and the people around us being broken. It's too easy to begin to identify everybody by their brokenness. Even even the medical system and the psychiatric system, diagnosing people in their brokenness as though that's their nature. And the beauty of the theology of the body and the beauty of this quote from Pope Benedict XVI, who loved the theology of the body, yeah. says we need to look beyond sin, beyond our woundedness, beyond everything about us that's broken, and see the goodness of who God intended us to be and the goodness of who we're becoming in our glorification. That's what speaks to me. How about you? Uh, it's, yeah, very, very similar. But something else that really is important for me is that when I think about healing, I know for me is I need a baseline. I need to know what the goal is. Like, what is healing? You know, I remember in my graduate program, the question of what is healthy Uh or what is normal, right? And so it was very interesting that we were asking very deep philosophical and anthropological questions, but we were studying psychology. And you'd think, well, those don't really go together, but they totally go together. And so what I love about what Pope Benedict's doing here and what the theology of the body does for healing is whoever wishes to heal man, I'd be like, yeah, that, that's, that's what I do. That's my profession. I must first see humans in their wholeness. 
oh my gosh, so if I'm ever going to actually engage in a healing process or help someone be healed, whether I'm, I'm doing the offering or I'm receiving, I have to have a vision of what a fully integrated whole person looks like first. Mm-hmm. That's a critical starting point. Otherwise, I can, I can lead them anywhere. You know, So I think just from a theoretical point of view, I find that so helpful. And it's actually every great theory is very practical because it informs what you do or don't do. It informs the decisions and the directions that you go. So this quote to me is so helpful because I know now that I have to have an adequate anthropology. That's what John Paul II and people refer to the theology of the body as. I have to have a decent understanding of what human was intended to be before I can know what healing looks like. And secondarily, if you're going to experience healing, it's going to come through God's love. And I think what's interesting about that is that sometimes in the psychological world, people can say, well, that doesn't mean you have to pray all the time for God to heal someone. And I would say, sure, I have a pretty broad view of the way God can love people. Like, <laughs> I, I don't see him smashing through doors and going, you better make the sign of the cross before I love you. The sign of the cross is important. It's critical. It's powerful. It's good. But God's not like stingy. Uh, with his love and the expressions of love. You could be doing really good basic psychotherapy and it could be an experience of God's love. Mm -hmm. Um, That's one of the values I've always appreciated about our relationship is we have the ability to be able to see something in the secular psychological culture and be able to go, that's infused with the spirit of God. And the people might not even know that that it is. And that's a good reason why it's being, it's very effective, you know, for people is because God's loves all over it. If I can add, just add to that a second. The whole natural world is an expression of the Father's love. We're going back to the original and before sin came into the world, before brokenness came into the world. Everything that God created is part of his goodness, is part of his love. So our bodies naturally heal because of God's love. Our, Our minds have a natural disposition towards wholeness because of God's love. I like how you phrased it because it's putting things back in right order, you know, where the reason that this is the case is because of God's love. It's not like God's love was absent and then I had to put it in there. Mm. It's more about removing the dynamics that are blocking me from seeing and receiving God's love. He doesn't stop loving. Anyway, I, there's, gosh, we could, there's so much more I think we could go into with that. But the reason we picked the quote is because it's such a great articulation of one, the healing process, but two, identity. So identity is a phrase, Bob, that gets tossed around all over the place in the secular world and even in the psychological world where people are having an identity crisis or, you know, they've lost themselves or, oh, they're Mm -hmm. going away to find themselves, you know, and all these phrases that we just toss around. But I love that JP too, and the theology of the body really says this is important. And I think the thing that we're really emphasizing here is what is identity? It's who am I in relation to God? Yes. I like to emphasize two questions. What am I and who am I in relation to God? How do you articulate it? Yeah, in the same way. It's like, who am I and whose am I? And if you think about how we think about identity in the world, you know, we think about, well, I'm a Catholic or I'm a man or my last name is Schutz or your last name is Kim. Those are all places that we use to identify what's unique about us or what we, who we belong to, you know, the combination of those things begins to express some of our uniqueness, but there's some in common. You know, identity is something we share in common. Right. But before God, each one of us is known by God in such a unique way that our voice is totally unique from anybody else's. Our fingerprints are totally unique. Our, our ways of thinking, our formation, and all of that before God is who he created each of us to be. I think we talked about it a couple of times ago about the, the handiwork of God. You know, that yes. they were so uniquely knit together in our mother's womb, mm-hmm. to use that phrase from scripture. Yeah. How about you? What it makes me think about with regard to healing is when you say, who am I and whose am I? You could, you could say in some ways that what healing is, is a restoration between God and his people but more specifically, the restoring of the relationship between God and you, you as an individual. And that restoration happens on an objective level and a subjective level. Those are two words that John Paul II uses. And basically, objective means 
It's just true. Two plus two is four. That's true, whether you like it or not. Subjective means my inner world, the, the stuff that's unique to me. And so with regard to healing, I'm hearing you say that it happens in relationship, in a restoration of relationship. And what are we restored to? What I was designed to be objectively, but also who I was designed to be subjectively, like the unique you. So when you're restored, Bob fully alive is going to look different than Jake fully alive, even though we're both men, we're both, we even have the same birthday, right? We have all these similarities, but that final fully alive thing is unique and that is honored in the healing process. And that's the part of the identity thing I think we're getting at is there's a nature to it being human, but there's also a uniqueness and unrepeatability part of it that John Paul II second alludes to i think that's really important with regard to healing and yeah if we were to use two two examples from scripture let's say mary magdalene as a woman and saint paul as a man yes yes uh, they were always paul and mary there was a lot of their uniqueness was there their whole life Bob, but i after, feel like we should include peter and say peter paul and mary yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'm listening to my dad's anyway sorry <laughs> go ahead. i was thinking of peter before so there, there you go <laughs> And so Mary didn't become less Mary when she met Jesus. She became more fully herself. Yes. Paul, as after he had his encounter on the road, he took everything that he had before and just got freed up to be who he really was. And even though he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ in, who lives in me, he didn't disappear. He just lived in the fullness of who he was meant to be in Christ. Yes. I think that's so important. It's an interesting question that sometimes gets asked in the healing journey. like. Will I still be me if I get healed? Mm -hmm. I think because people have so identified with their brokenness and woundedness, there's a sincere question of, you know, am I still going to, is it still, is Jake still going to be there? Mm -hmm. And I think what's beautiful about what you're saying is Jake's going to be there to a fuller extent than you've ever experienced him before. Yeah. And you will experience yourself and others will experience you more fully alive. Yes. And I love your example of look at Paul, the broken Paul and a more redeemed and restored Paul, him becoming more of himself. Man, his life looked pretty different. He acted in quite a different way as his heart was transformed into being who he really was, as God intended him to be who he really was. Yeah. So let's take Peter, for example, now. And All right. uh, since you brought him up, <laughs> you, you know, yeah. talking about seeing somebody in their wholeness. Yes. And it's only God's love that, what did Jesus say as soon as he met him? Mm -hmm. You are Peter and on this rock I will build my church, right? So Jesus saw the vision of his wholeness, of yes. his calling. Even though Jesus knew at least at some point that Peter was going to betray him, that Peter was far from, you know, get behind me, Satan. That Peter was far from living into who God called him to be. That was going to be a process. But Jesus saw him in his wholeness. His identity before Jesus never wavered through all of that in and out, up and down that Peter went through. And really what happened for Peter is he began to trust who he was in the eyes of uh, his wife. There's an image in the show uh, Chosen where Jesus encounters Peter's wife, mm -hmm. uh, and, he, and he thanks her for seeing who Peter really is before most of the rest of the people did. That's just a beautiful illustration of this. As you're saying that, Bob, I, I have to say that it's been very healing for me personally when people have seen me when I couldn't, mm -hmm. or they, they didn't lose sight of me when I lost sight of myself. And, you know, a big part of my journey is uh, struggles with sexual addiction. And, you know, Heather was just incredible in that. And she says now that one of the important things for her was she knew that wasn't who I was. Mm -hmm. And that's an incredible grace to be able to see beyond the brokenness and the sin to who I really was. And she, and she kept using that concept of, this is not you. This is not who you are. And, and for a while, that was very triggering and disruptive to me because mm -hmm. I couldn't see the potential or who I was. Someone else could see it. And, you know, that sometimes could be scary for folks, you know, when all they've ever, maybe ever considered is I'm terrible or I'm ugly or I'm no good. That when somebody says something to you that you can't see, 
what if it's true? Mm. You know, what if it's good and mm. beautiful? You know, I think that's, you know, when we get so locked into our wounds and somebody says to us something that's different than the message of the wound, it can be very hard to hear. Mm -hmm. It's that experience of, I can't take a compliment. Yeah. I, know, I, I can't, can't believe that. Yeah. It's not the story that I've been told or the mm -hmm. story that I tell myself. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the truth is, what if there's something deeper than that? Mm -hmm. You know, the concept from the Theology of the Body that comes up for me is this concept of the heritage of the heart. It's a difficult concept in some ways to explain philosophically or theologically, but its essence, I have a quote here that I could read from um, one of the general audiences that really speaks to there is a you underneath it all. Mm -hmm. You know, the goodness hasn't totally been wiped away and distorted. This is John Paul II. He says, it is important that precisely in his heart, in, he's talking about humanity. It's important pr that precisely in his heart, he does not feel himself irrevocably accused. And I think, man, mm. is that ever mm. so powerful that mm. we in our hearts often feel irrevocably accused. I'm mm. never going to get better. This is the only place I can be, right? And then he goes on to say, but in the same heart, man himself should feel called mm. with energy. And it's like this, I'm calling out to you. It's, it's, like, it's like Lazarus in the mm. tomb. Mm -hmm. I see the live man in there, even though everybody else sees death in there. And then JP2 goes on to say, called as a person in the truth of his humanity, mm. and thus also in the truth of his masculinity and femininity, the truth of his body. This was the part that really stuck out to me. Called in that truth, which has been his inheritance of the beginning, the inheritance of his heart, which is deeper than the sinfulness inherited. Mm. I mean, basically mm. JP2 is saying, there's a you that's deeper than the wounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful. It yeah. reminds me of his quote on World Youth Day, which he says, you are not the sum of your weaknesses and failures. You are the yeah. sum of the Father's love for you and the very real possibility of becoming the image of his son. Again, the beginning and the end. I mean, that's wholeness. How were we were created and what are we going to look like in heaven? I don't know if I've shared this before, but just one of the most consoling things for me with my wife Margie after she died was I had a dream. And in the dream, I saw her in her resurrected state, you know, very human, but perfect. It was the person I fell in love with mm. without the flaws, without the weaknesses, without the, the yeah. struggles, without whatever else. Yeah. And just seeing her, she was radiant. She was full of glory. But, and it just gave me such deep consolation that that's, that's who she is. That's her. Yeah. That, that's who I saw from the very beginning when I fell in love with her, but never saw her in her fullness mm -hmm. until that image. Wow. I mean, you're describing there what happens when you are in relationship with someone who's healed and who yeah, experiences completely healed. healed. Yeah. It changed you. You yes. were different. Yes. At, at witnessing her fully alive. You know, something that when you were talking earlier about Peter and Paul, is their names. And it, mm. and it makes me think about, you know, one of the parts about identity that's really critical is the name, our name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it even correlates with what uh, John Paul II talks about with this experience of identity, because he, he breaks open this experience of Adam naming the animals. And basically he bumps into the reality of like, hey, yeah. the, these, they're not doing it for me, right? Like this, w there's something missing here, you know? And in the naming of the animals, he bumps into himself, how he's different than them. And that's this kind of deep philosophical reflection. But one of the things that it highlights, I think, is really important for the healing journey is, one, our name and the name that God has for us. And two, the names that we've been called. You know, mm. phrase that drives me crazy. I don't know why we teach this to our kids. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I'm like, that's a bunch of baloney. Like words can be deadly, like so deadly, you know, words do hurt, you know, especially when they're, when they're irrevocably accusing you inside your mind and inside your heart, you know? So Peter and, and Paul were both renamed mm -hmm. and it spoke to a deeper identity about who they are. And I don't know about you, but 
there's been some powerful experiences I've had with the Lord that have been very healing, where mm-hmm. I've gone to him with the question of, who do you see that I am? Mm-hmm. How do you see me? What are words that you see in describing of me? Now, to be able to do that, we have to have a pretty accurate image of God. Mm-hmm. And that's something that we bump into in the healing process is that we might not be seeing God as who he actually is. We might be seeing through the lens of our human experience, through the experiences of our mother and our father and our siblings and our coaches and our teachers. And then we look at God and all of a sudden God doesn't seem very nice anymore. Mm-hmm. But essentially we're projecting onto God what our experience of authority figures has been. Mm-hmm. So we lose his identity. And when we lose his identity, we lose our own. Amen. Let's talk that out. Yeah. When we lose sight of God, we lose sight of ourselves. Yeah. Again, going back to original man, uh, in yep. the beginning, Adam knows himself only before God, and then in right. relation to the rest of creation. But he knows himself first before God. And right. so that's who he truly is. That's him and yes. his wholeness. As soon as the enemy comes in and begins to lie to him, the father of lies, begins to lie to him about who the father is, he begins to lose his, his identity. He begins to his identity begins to diminish. He hasn't lost it, but he begins to lose touch with it, to lose touch with who he is. And so from that point forward, all of creation in a fallen world begins to communicate an image of God because the parents are the image of God. Uh, When the parents are broken, they communicate a broken image to God. All of our peers communicate a broken image of God because it's distorted love. It's distorted truth. I mean, it's it's lies uh, that we internalize. Not all, but, you know, partially. And so as we internalize that, our view of God changes. And as we have a distorted view of God, now we can't see ourselves in the mirror for who we are. And then our identity becomes distorted as God's identity becomes distorted. The psychological concept that that correlates to is called mentalization. It's a fairly advanced psychological concept where children, it's it's part of the attachment theory, but children find themselves and their self-image through their perception of how their mom and dad see them. Mm-hmm. In other words, they picture inside mom and dad's mind what they look like. It's like a little picture of themselves over in mom and dad's mind, and they go, that's who I am. So my identity is literally held within the other. And yeah. that process and that concept of mentalization is a, is, a, is a fascinating way that a lot of psychologists think that's where identity comes from. That's mm-hmm. how selfhood is developed is and we're describing the exact same thing with regard to the biblical reality the who am i in god you know because yeah, no matter how well our parents loved us there's always a distortion yeah i mean they can't love us the way that god loves us completely and they see us through through all of their brokenness you know the, all of their brokenness is projected out to us and so right. it's not true about us but we think it is yeah you know it's one of those things that what I'm hearing you say that most people might not think about is that we're walking around most of the time with some pretty big questions out there, like some pretty big fundamental questions like, who am I? Am I lovable? Mm-hmm. Do I matter? And, and that's fairly normal in a fallen world. But if I'm not aware that I'm asking these deep, powerful questions, I'll bring those questions to places that I shouldn't necessarily bring them to. And what we're saying is the only way we're truly going to have our questions answered, deep heart questions answered, the only way we're really going to hear our name, receive our identity is in relationship to God and not the God that you might perceive from your brokenness, but, but who he really is, mm-hmm. you know? And so on a practical level, yeah, that's where, where I'm going I? in my heart too. What does that look like practically? I know for me, I can take my deep questions to the wrong places. Like if I do well at something, then that means I'm lovable. Mm -hmm. That's a really dangerous way to navigate life because the truth is I'm not always going to do well. And if my lovability is dependent on that, some days I'm lovable, some days I'm not. Mm -hmm. That's not the truth of who God is. But I think to make it practical, I'm just, my mind's being jogged about what you said earlier with the experience of Adam. He knew who he was in relationship with God. The enemy came in and assaulted his image of God, which caused him to lose himself. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that's a critical component to the healing process is where do I find my identity? Yeah, I'd like to just lead everybody in a prayer again related to that. This one I've used often, and I think it just speaks to the reality and, and brings the power of the Holy Spirit into that reality. And we use his name because he's the one who totally knows who he is before the Father, and the Father blessing upon Jesus is, is a complete communion. In the name of Jesus Christ, I renounce the identity that I've received from everybody in my life who's incompletely told me who I am. I renounce the authority that I've given them to tell me who I am. And I now place that authority in you, Heavenly Father, because you alone know me and love me completely and see me for who I am. Amen. Amen. One of the things that we're doing there when we talk about the experience of humanity is that we do have an authority about who we let tell us who we are. Mm -hmm. And Adam shifted the authority from God to the enemy, from the father to the enemy, to the father of lies. And what we're doing there is a restoration of whom I let tell me who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of people don't even realize that they have that choice. Mm. You don't have to listen to what everybody says about you. Like, it, it, that's okay to not, believe what everybody says and that subtle message of well if they said it it's true that, that's what you're doing by we're, when we renounce we're, we're breaking off that tie and giving the authority back where it needs to be what you quoted before about sticks and stones i think that was the positive side of that sticks and stones is sticks and stones can break my bones but words can never hurt me because i'm, gonna, I'm not going to let them in i'm not going to agree with them in that sense it, it works on both sides that's very true. Yeah. If I prevent agreeing with, and, that, and that's a concept that's I think we'll have to get into at some point yeah. as well. What is an agreement? And maybe very quickly, an agreement is saying yes to something that's said to me. Mm -hmm. like I could say to you, Bob, you're amazing. And you have the choice of whether or not to agree with that. Mm -hmm. But I could also say, Bob, you're an idiot. And you could have the choice of whether or not to agree with that. And that's a critical component that most people don't realize is that I don't have to agree with everything. And I have a choice mm -hmm. of whether or not to let that in. Yeah. I think that's a good practical is for each person who's, who's listening here to think about what you've agreed with and whether that's coming from the Father or whether that's coming from some other source and to renounce those agreements that aren't a part of what God says about you and agree with the things that he says about you. And maybe on another time, we'll, we'll go through that renouncing and announcing that we've done before at conferences. Absolutely. Yeah. Renouncing very simply is, no, I don't agree with that. That's, that's basically it. It doesn't have to be super complex. Like we heard, Bob, when you prayed, is that you're just basically breaking something off and shifting your yes to something else. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for listening. You can find all of our episodes on iTunes or other places that you find podcasts, or you can go to our website, restoretheglorypodcast.com. You can subscribe there to receive episodes right to your inbox. God bless you. And we pray that you would experience the abundance of God's love, mercy, and healing.